I want to speak today about how to find your voice, how to find your voice. We all use our voices every day to communicate. Your voice is not random. It's a powerful, dynamic, specific, unique gift from God. There's no one else who has a voice quite like yours. It's like your vocal DNA, it's unique. And words have power. They have power to heal and to bring hope and to restore and to comfort, to inspire, to warn and to reveal truth. And we need wisdom about when to speak and how to speak. But sometimes it's easy to speak up and sometimes it's very hard. And we live in a time of great complexity, great cultural change, great challenge. And things move so fast at the moment in our world that it's difficult even to find the words to speak, let alone get them out of our mouths. So I'm excited that we're beginning this series on Jonah today. And Jonah is a prophet who was called by God to speak. Jonah was someone who was given God's specific word for a people and actually for a whole city. And his responsibility as a prophet was to take the word that had been given to him and to speak it out to the people he was sent to him. That was his job description. That was all he was asked to do and everything he was asked to do. God's word to the city, something people desperately needed to hear. And yet what we see is that for the first eight verses of this passage, Jonah is completely and utterly silent. He doesn't speak at all. We don't hear him say one word. And he runs from the very place where his voice could have had an impact. Why is that? And what can we learn from that? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. And the first thing we see in this passage is how important it is to listen up. The passage begins with God speaking to Jonah. He says, arise, go to that great city of Nineveh and preach out in the Hebrew, cry out against it because its wickedness has come up, has arisen before me. And God speaks his word to send Jonah to speak against Nineveh, a a city which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And you all know the Assyrian Empire was one of the cruelest and most vicious empires that there ever has been in the history of the world. It was famous for its cruelty across the whole world. And Nineveh was the capital of that empire. In, in, In the Assyrian Empire, they were famous for For when they captured their opponents, they didn't just kill them, they dismembered their bodies and made examples of every single one of them. Particularly gruesome, they cut off all of their limbs apart from their right hand so they could shake their hand and look into their eyes as they died. Really, really unpleasant. They would burn adolescents alive. It was horrific. And that city, Nineveh, was in modern-day Iraq, actually the part of Mosul, which is on the eastern bank of the Tigris River. There was about 120,000 people who lived there, which by ancient standards was a huge, huge city. And God says, its wickedness has arisen, that's what the word means, arisen before me. Most people think that means that people, because whenever you have wickedness in a city and powerful people in a city, there's another group of people who are suffering in that city. The cries of the people of those suffering in the city had arisen before God and God is concerned to the extent that he decides to intervene and send his messenger to speak out against the people because he cares for the people. He hears the cries of those who are suffering. And God's warning in life is always a feature of his mercy. He wants to let the city know just how much it's at risk. He wants, he wants Jonah to arise and cry out because the cries of the people have arisen to me. He says 120,000 people don't know they're right from their wrong. And so God intervenes. His warning is his mercy. And it might be your experience in life that when someone warns you, it's not because they dislike you or are being unkind to you, although sometimes it feels that way. It's because they care about you. And Jonah has a choice. Is he going to obey God and go and speak to Nineveh, or is he going to disobey him? And in this context, there was obviously a cost to Jonah's obedience. Obedience always comes at a cost. Uh, It's costly, it's risky, it's painful. Uh, Can you imagine being Jonah, one person sent on your own to speak against 120,000 people who are renowned for their cruelty? who are renowned for the way they treat people who they don't like and people who are not like them. It's not good odds 
and he looks like it's deemed to failure. Plus, you know, if we're honest, who wants to see evil people saved anyway? You know, l- let them be. God will sort them out eventually. Um, they're not living right. They're a nightmare. For Jonah, it's high risk, low reward. And there's a cost to obedience, obviously. But it's worth saying there's a cost to disobedience too. It's just that we don't always see it at first. It's one thing to hear God's call. It's another thing to respond and to speak and use your voice. Because when you feel the nudge from God to speak up, you can think, well, what if what I say is not appreciated? What if people don't like what I say? What if people marginalize me because of what I say? What if it's unpopular? What if you share a bit about what you believe and people around you don't like the fact that you have your faith? What if you speak up? You've got a faith and and people are not comfortable with that. What if you have a different way of viewing an ethical decision in the workplace and you say something and people disagree with you? Sometimes it's really challenging. You know, maybe even saying that you've got faith at all in the workplace feels like a massive thing. And then the moment comes, maybe tomorrow or Monday, you know, at the coffee station, someone says to you, what did you do yesterday? I'm like, oh, uh, sung a bit. <laughs> what? I decided to go singing. What? Where did you sing? Oh, I just, just thought I'd go and sing with some people. Why did you do that? It's good for your health. You know, it kind of exercises your lungs. You feel better. It's good communal activity. Oh, where did you sing? Wow, just with some friends. How many friends? A few hundred friends. You went singing yesterday with a few hundred friends. Yeah, why? Well, you know, I'm just exploring things at the moment. Life's complex, just looking for, what, tell me more. I mean, you, suddenly you're kind of, and you, before you know it, you're kind of painting yourself into a little corner of the coffee room trying to explain your faith. I used to lead a football outreach project in Tower Hamlets in East London and uh, helped to lead it. And we would run training on Saturdays throughout the year. And then one week of the year, we'd have this big tournament for youth from right across the area. And we loved it. And then on the middle night of the tournament, the Wednesday night, we would share a bit about why we were motivated to do all the training throughout the year and why we did the tournament. And that was just for us to tell these 60, 70, 80 kind of East End youth why we organised this football tournament. And the reason was because we had faith. But I don't know if you've ever stood up before 80 youth from Tower Hamlets and tried to explain your faith. It's a little bit nerve-wracking. And also, they don't always feel like the obligation of attention. Yeah, that, yeah, good example. That's exactly how they do it. Yeah, they don't always feel the obligation of attention, and so uh, the, so you try and think how can we make this even more engaging for them. So we do this thing called matchstick testimonies. I don't know if you've ever done a matchstick testimony. It's a dangerous thing. I don't recommend it if you're at home. But um, so what we do is we'd stand in front of 60, 70 youth. You always don't light it instantly, just to get the kind of anticipation. <laughs> And we'd say, well, the reason we do what we do is because we believe that there's a God and he knows you and he knows every bit of you. And sometimes life feels random and painful and confusing, but actually there's a God who made the world and he cares about you. And he didn't stand apart from this world, but he came into this world and he cares enough to take the, ouch, take the, your sin on his shoulder and because he wants to enter into a relationship with you as a much loved daughter, a much loved son of his and you can know him and then eventually be like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Matchstick testimony. And they'd all be like, it's going to burn his fingers. It's going to burn his fingers. And they'd be absolutely... So about six of us would give these testimonies and each time it got more and more painful. But sometimes it can be a bit like that in life. Because... You're kind of given these opportunities by God to speak out on his behalf. And sometimes you think, oh, well, not now. I mean, not now. I'm I'm just a student, you know. I'll do that when I'm in my 20s, you know, so you just put it in your back pocket. And then when you're in the 20s, you're like, it's very difficult when you're starting off in the workplace. You've got to impress the right people. You know, know, I don't want to do it now when I'm in my... 30s. And then when you're in your 30s, you're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, thinking about starting a family, you know. If my boss doesn't like me now and I, I let him know I'm a Christian now, that would be really costly. So, you know, I, not this decade, maybe next decade. And then when you're in your 40s, you're like, well, now I'm in a leadership position. I don't want to impose my faith on the people in my team. So, you know, I kind of can't really talk about my faith publicly here. And then when you're in your 50s, you're like, well, this is probably the time. But what was it I was going to say? I can't quite remember. <laughs> 
And these opportunities come along and sometimes we just bury them in our back pocket. Sometimes we're like, oh no, I'm ready. I still remember being at a dinner party and there was a guy who was sitting opposite me. He was like, I'm interested in exploring spirituality. I think I might explore Buddhism. You know, I, I think that, do you think I should do that? I said, maybe. I was a Christian. I was like, why don't you come on up? I didn't say it. I was like, well, maybe I should say something. Maybe it's not my moment. It's a dinner party. Might feel a bit awkward. Don't want to crash against him. Don't want him to think I'm judging Buddhism. But he's not actually a Buddhist. He hasn't even explored it yet. But I was kind of running all these things through my mind. Before I know it, like, the conversation goes somewhere else. I'm like, oh, I missed, I missed the moment. Sometimes we're there. And we're like, oh, this, actually, there's a moment, there's a moment. Maybe you're with a colleague and you're speaking. And then you start speaking and they look a bit funny. And before you know it, the fear comes and you're like, <laughs> you blow out the flame. We're all given all these different opportunities through our lives to speak out on God's behalf. But sometimes we don't make the most of the opportunity to use them. Jonah doubtless felt fear, but it wasn't irrational. It's risky. But it's not just fear. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to him. Sometimes God's instruction to you doesn't make any sense to you. Why would you go to these people, God? Why would you send me to these people, God? He probably thought this, these people are never going to change from their ways. And even if they do, that's not a good thing. Probably feels a bit superior to them. What he doesn't realize is there are probably some people in that city who are already crying out to God. They're already asking God to move. God said, one way of translating what God says here is, arise and cry out because the cries of the people have arisen to me. I've never thought about it that way before. You know when you feel the nudge in the workplace? Maybe I should invite my friend enough. You feel the nudge in the workplace? Maybe I should talk to that person about faith. It never occurs to me that maybe the night before, at 10 p.m., 11 p.m., midnight, as they went to bed, they cried out, help. I'm lost, I'm confused. God, if you're there, would you send someone? God, if you're there, would you, would you help me explore faith? It never has occurred to me that the nudge I feel might be to enable me to be an answer to the prayer that someone else has ever prayed. Never occurred to me when I've been at a boardroom table, we've been talking about an ethical issue, and I'm thinking, well, there's a framework for this in the Bible, maybe I should kind of you know, use, use my experience in that context to help provide a framework for this ethical issue we're dealing with at work. Never occurred to me that someone else around the table might be saying, we need wisdom, and we're not finding it in our current context. Maybe there are ancient sources of wisdom we can draw on. Never occurs to me never occurred to me that sometimes my obedience to God's seemingly crazy nudge might enable me to be the answer to someone else's prayer. The second thing we see here is how important it is to wake up. Jonah is sent to Nineveh to bear witness to the pagans and he flees to Tarshish, which is roughly in the opposite direction. He runs from what God has asked him to do. He runs from God. In the Hebrew, it says he flees from God's presence. It's one thing to run from a difficult situation. It's another thing to try and flee from God's presence. It's really hard to flee from God. It's really hard. Because what you find is, wherever you go, he's there. You you go here, he's there. You go here, he's already there. You're running from God is like trying to flee from air. You know, wherever you go, it's there, and sooner or later, you're going to have to take a breath. Running from God is running from the very thing you most need. It's only everywhere you go, and there's only so long you can hold your breath. Even Jonah's disobedience here doesn't really work. God turns it to serve his purposes. Sometimes people say to me, how can I find God's purpose for my life? I think a much more difficult question is how can you avoid God's purpose for your life? I mean, Jonah avoids Nineveh because he doesn't want to speak to pagan people about God. He finds himself on a boat surrounded by pagan people who want to talk about God. (laughs) It's tricky. God cares about your life. He can guide your life with precision and he can use even your mistakes to serve his purposes. Jonah runs in the opposite direction. And he finds himself surrounded by the very people he doesn't want to speak to. I was once in a restaurant with a a friend of mine who was an atheist. And just during the meal, I just felt like I had a picture for him. It's a slightly random picture. And we had never talked about things like that. But I thought I I had to be obedient, so it sounded a bit crazy. So I said, look, I, I just feel I've got this picture for you. His eyes went wide and he said, that that resonates exactly with me. I said, oh, that's encouraging. He said, can I become a Christian? And I said, what now? 
And he was like, he was like, yeah. And I was like, what in the restaurant? And he was like, why not? And I said, I don't know. But I, I he said, he said, well, where's better, inside or outside? I said, I don't know. He said, Steve, this is your thing. Help me. Where should we pray? And I was like, maybe outside. So we went outside this restaurant, and we're outside on the pavement, and we did a little prayer. And actually, as it happened, he became a Christian. And then, but we were living in different cities, and I, I tried to get him plugged into a church. I, he started reading the Bible. I tried to get him a mentor, all these kind of things. But it felt like there was only so much we could do because we were quite far away from each other. And about two months later, he was finding it really hard. And on a Saturday night, he sent me an email to say, uh, look, I'm finding this too hard, Stephen. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up on this whole faith thing. Now, I was staying in another part of the country with friends that weekend. And he was staying in another part of the country with friends that weekend. And because I was staying with friends... I didn't have access to my emails. It was a time when you couldn't get emails on your phone. It's a much simpler age. And, uh, and so I didn't know he'd sent this email. And on the Sunday, I was driving back to my city, and he was driving back to his city. And I was driving across the country, and on the motorway, I got to just outside Milton Keynes, and I thought, I'm desperate for loot. I've got to stop. So I went into Milton Keynes, couldn't find a loot anywhere, eventually parked outside some massive shopping centre, went inside, couldn't find a loot, walked, walked, walked. Eventually, at the back of the shopping centre, I found a loot. And the relief, I tell you. <laughs> and I walked out of the loot, and to my astonishment, I bumped straight into my friend. Because he was coming back from another part of the country, and he had also gone past Milton Keynes, and needed the loot at exactly the same time. And he had left the motorway and tried to find a loot and ended up. So we were both crossing the country. The only point at which our journeys intersected was Milton Keynes, when we both needed a loo, and we stopped, and we both went to the same loo. So I came out of this loo, and I bumped into my friend, and he looked at me with absolute terror. And he said, Steve, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? I said, this is like amazing. What are the odds? And he just, all the colour drained from his faith. He looked at faith. He looked absolutely astonished. He said, Steve, I can't believe you. I said, I can't believe you. I said, this must be like a million to one. He was like this. I said, it's almost like God wanted us to bump into each other. He was like... (laughs) Anyway, we had this little chat and I got in the car, drove home, you know, fired up my email. And there were two emails from him. One from the night before. Steve, I don't think I can continue with my faith. And then another one which is private. But it started with, until my dying day, I will never be able to explain how we bumped into each other outside a loo in Milton (laughs) Keynes. I can explain it. It's really hard to run from God. Because wherever you go, He's there. What does the psalmist say? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths of the sea, you're there. If I go to Milton Keynes, you're there. (laughs) He's there. You can't run from God's presence. He'll find you anywhere. And he knows how to get your attention. The most common word in this passage is the sea. And you'll know in ancient literature, the sea is like the archetype for all that is beyond human control. It represents all the areas in our lives which we don't have control over. And sometimes God uses events outside our control to get our attention. Sometimes God uses events outside our control to remind us that we are never really in control, though we like to feel we are. Sometimes storms are random. Sometimes they are God's wake-up call. And here God sends a storm. He sends a wind to cause a mighty storm. He intervenes. Why? Why? Because God is too holy and too loving to just leave Jonah to his own devices. To allow him to remain as he is or to abandon him. He wants to intervene in his life and draw him back to God and turn him back to the right path. Sometimes the storms you face are God's way of getting you to seek his face. And when this storm comes, everyone is terrified. All the people start crying out, each to their own God, afraid. And Jonah knows what's going on, and he hides and he sleeps. It's fascinating. Jonah is called to speak to a city of 120,000 people. It's called to be part of God's saving plan for the redemption of an entire empire. And where is he? He's hiding in a tiny cabin on a little ship 
in the middle of the sea. The harder you try and run from God, the smaller your world will become. It's made for so much more. And the captain comes to Jonah and says, same word, arise and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we will not perish. He says, come on, you know, he's like, pray. How can you be asleep? And when the pagans are telling you to pray, you know you've got a challenge. You know something is going on. Arise. Everyone else on the boat is praying. They're all crying out with desperation to their idols and their gods. You say, well, it's desperation. Well, God can use desperation. People say, oh yeah, well, well, God wants desire. He doesn't just want desperation. God can start with this desperation. You cry out desperately to him at 2 a.m., that's fine. He'll supply the desire later. But often God intervenes when people cry out to him in desperation for him to move in their lives, in their workplaces, in their homes, in their families, in their cities. It's the captain who says, look, get up, wake up. Sleep is a gift from God, but there are times when we have to wake up. Sometimes we feel a bit sleepy. Life's been a bit challenging. Maybe we've got hurt by something. Life's been a bit complex. We've got a bit disappointed. We started to soft pedal. But this is a moment. Church, this is a moment when God is moving powerfully in our community, in our city. And we've got to wake up and respond to that. Just, just the stories we just heard. It's powerful what is happening. I heard other stories. I was speaking to someone after one of our services last Sunday, an atheist philosopher who's, who has just been exploring faith over the last six months and has decided she's going to believe in the truth about Jesus Christ. She said, I've never known a joy and a peace like it in my entire life. She said, I spent 34 years as an atheist. And now I've decided to believe. That's miraculous. I was at the prayer meeting at 7 a.m. on Tuesday. I don't always think I'm, I'm holy for doing that. Beth pretty much had to kick me out of bed at um, 6.30. I just made it and I live very close. Uh, so I kind of, I stumbled into the church. Kind of half asleep, where's my coffee? One of the people at that prayer meeting she had come to faith in Jesus eight days before. Eight days before. First time she'd been in church was at our Good Friday service. She was here at 7 a.m. to pray. That's crazy. That's a miracle. Wake up. This is the moment. Look at what God is doing. We're seeing an openness and an opportunity like with we've never seen before. There is so much that might happen in this season. We have to wake up and respond to what God is doing. This is not the time to hibernate. This is not the time to hide away. This is the time to wake up and to make the most of every opportunity that comes our way. Wake up. But then we also want to step up. The crew cast lots for who is responsible and the lot falls to Jonah. They say, what do, you, what do you do? Where are you from? And Jonah speaks for the first time. He tells them he's running from God and he says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> made the sea and the dry land. And then they are absolutely terrified. What shall we do? And Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. I know it's my fault this great storm has come on you. He goes from silence to speaking, from disinterestedness to being willing to give himself on behalf of those pagans around him. He's willing to lose his life to save theirs. Now, Jonah didn't really care enough. He didn't really have enough faith. Maybe you feel the same way today. You say, I'm not going to pray for my boss. I don't even like my boss. Why would I pray for them? I'm not going to pray for my sister. I still don't forgive her for stealing that dress when we were 16 years old. No. I'm not going to pray for that colleague. They're difficult. They send passive aggressive emails all the time. But that sometimes we get proximate and we realize actually people are, are searching for things. They need something that we have. They're looking, they're asking questions, they're crying out, each to their own God, trying, trying in desperation to find a way through some of the complexity we're finding. And we have the key, we have the answer, we have exactly what they need. 
and sometimes we hold it to ourselves. So important to get proximate, to get close. And Jonah on this little boat sees this group of people, these sailors, and realizes they bear the image of God every bit as much as he does. And then we need to get passionate. It begins with realizing the mercy we have received from God. Being excited about people encountering that mercy of God. You know, maybe you haven't run to Tarshish, but I think we can all think of a time when we've felt God calling us in one way and we've stepped in a different way. When we've felt God was giving us a nudge and we haven't responded. When we've turned away from God and distanced ourselves or not done something he's asked us to do. I want to say to you today, it's not too late. It's not too late. Jonah says, throw me into the sea. The sailors ignore his request. You know, Jonah is willing to wash his hands of them, the pagans, Nineveh, but they're not willing to wash their hands of him. And they both do their best to row the boat to land. And then they cry out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for you, Lord, have done as you please. The whole boat is crying out to the Lord. Real prayers of desperation. And they throw Jonah into the sea, and the sea goes calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows to him. Jonah disobeyed. Jonah ignored. Jonah didn't care. Jonah rejected God's instruction. And yet God's mercy is such that even at the point of his great disobedience to God, God is able to accomplish his purposes in Jonah's life because his calling and promises are irrevocable. They're unbreakable. Everyone in proximity to Jonah ends up worshipping the Lord. Jonah got there grudgingly, miserably, didn't really want to be doing it, half-hearted, reluctantly flops over the side of the boat. And God was able to use it as a foretaste of how he would bring salvation to many, many people. Don't underestimate the power, the significance, the impact of one small act of obedience in your life. It's like compound returns. Don't underestimate how God could use one yes from you this week to weave into his salvation purposes for our city and our nation. Don't think that just because you've messed up before or you haven't got it right before, God can't weave that into his salvation purposes in a way that would absolutely and completely astonish you. You might have lost your voice. You might feel like you've betrayed your conscience. You might feel that you've stepped away. You might feel like you've missed the opportunity. You might feel your voice doesn't have any significance anyway. It's not too late. Jesus said, yeah, you've seen the sign of Jonah, but one greater than Jonah is here. Jonah sacrificed himself to save the sailors. Jesus sacrificed himself to save the world. Jonah was cast out for his sin. Jesus was without sin, but took our sin on himself. Jonah only came near death, but Jesus passed through death and into eternal life. Jonah went outside the city, happy to see it destroyed. Jesus went outside the city to ensure that it was saved. And he hasn't given up on you or me or this city. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And he's just as passionate, just as powerful, just as present, just as strong, just as committed, cares just as much. Think what might happen as we pray to him this week. Lord, would you take my voice, my vocal cords, my speech, would you anoint it for your purposes wherever you have placed me, that I might speak words that bring glory to your name and hope to the people around me. In Jesus' name, amen.